Welcome to the late night edition of Days of Roar, a Detroit Tigers podcast by the Detroit Free Press. My name is Mark Gorosh, and I am here with Detroit Free Press beat writer Evan Petzold, who has been working really hard this week. And he's you saw a three and three week. Ev, how you doing? I'm doing well. Hey, let's give a shout out to all the moms out there. We're recording this late night on Mother's Day. I got a chance to uh, to see my mom, spend some time with her, get some family time after the Tigers 5-3 win on Sunday. Uh, yeah, shout out to all the moms. And uh, to my mom, Jennifer Petzl, love you. Thanks for everything you've done for me throughout my life. Um, it's always much appreciated. But yeah, for the Tigers, they played some good ball uh, coming out of the St. Louis series. Going into Cleveland, they took two of three from the Guardians, and then they played what I thought was a pretty poor three-game series against uh, the Seattle Mariners. They lost the first game 9-2. to two. They lost the second game 5 nothing, And then somehow they ended up winning Sunday's game 5-3. to three. Um, That was a game that you know kind of looked up and you said, wow, this, this is actually a game uh, here. It's 3-2, it's, it's to two. and the Tigers ended up coming back, and they, they tied the game on a great double from Akil Badu. And then a hit by pitch with Nick Maton. Funny situation. The guy hasn't been able to hit, you know, breaking balls or off speed pitches all season or really at any point in his big league career. And it just so happens that it's a, a slider that hits him in the foot with the bases loaded and the Tigers get the go ahead run. And then they had attack on, on a four pitch walk drawn by Andy Abanez. So an interesting game on Sunday, a rough series against the Mariners, I would say, but a pretty solid series against the guardians. So a little bit of an up and down um, which is kind of unlike what we've seen. We saw the, the slow start, and then we saw a little bit of a, a hot stretch. Um, and then now this week was a little bit more of a, a mixed bag. Yes, uh, very poor series against the Mariners. How they won today is one of those mysteries in a 162-game season. You just kind of shrug your shoulders and go, I'll take it. You take it where you can get them. <laughs> and it actually keeps a minute. They're 18 and 21. 18 and 18 since the first three game series against Tampa Bay, where it looked like they may have their charter of the in the American League revoked. But yeah, still still playing reasonably decent baseball. Lineup continues to evolve, playing the hot hand. Got Andy Abanez playing third base mm-hmm. most of the time these days. McKinstry leading off most of the time. And Akil Badu played quite a bit in left field this week. And, you know, struggling to find some footing in right field. Matt Veerling really, really fighting it. I think he's like four for 42 for the month of May. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Thank God still playing good defense. But, yep, on to uh, on to play Pittsburgh in their next series. Go to Washington afterwards. And if you think Pittsburgh's going to be a soft touch, Pittsburgh's playing their ass off. So I. Highly doubt they'll be a soft touch, even but, you know. But, but Mark, you you look at the schedule though, and you say, "Hey, look, the Tigers have a chance here to to make a run, right?" I mean, I know you have the Pirates, and they were off to a really good start, played really well to start the season, went slow for a, a little bit, but then seemed to be getting it back on track. But then you got the Nationals, and then you got the Royals, and then you got the White Sox. Those are three series that I mean, you, you would expect to take two out of three in all three of those. At least that's what you'd hope for. I, I think I think if you can come out of it taking two out of three in nah. all three of the series, you feel good about it. We're not gonna have we're not gonna have this talk because I'm gonna end it real quickly by saying remember when we thought Baltimore would be uh, a team that we might be able to get a few victories from and well I after they got done taking that. our lunch money, they took our mom's lunch money. They Yeah, but the they, Nationals don't do that. The Royals they, don't do that. The yeah, White Sox okay. don't do well, that. Well yeah, the, the 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 Royals I'm looking forward to playing. The Royals are twelve and thirty. And if you want to feel bad for the Detroit Tigers as a franchise, you know. <laughs> take a look at the KC Royals. That, the same can be said about the White Sox. It's even worse there right now. I mean, they just got a bunch of guys that don't seem like they don't, they, they don't seem like they want to be there right now. Yeah. Everybody's looking for a pass out of there. So, but you know, like I said, 18 and 21 kind of tread water a little this week, but didn't go backwards. A lot of things could have been worse starting pitching aside from uh, Michael Lorenzen and uh, Eduardo Rodriguez was pretty tragic. Bullpen, once again, outstanding boys from the last 12 outs. Got 19 outs today. 19. So 
How much of a surprise has that been? I mean, we came into the season, Mark, thinking, how are they going to make this work? How, how is this even going to, like, how, how this, it, one, it, it didn't seem sustainable. And it didn't even seem like there was anything to sustain at the beginning. And then suddenly, these guys are just pitching their butts off. And it's just one after, I mean, Alex Lang, for all the, the concerns that I've had about his command, for the most part, he's been pretty polished. I know he walked two in Sunday's game and made it a little interesting there, but he gets the job done. Jason Foley has been dynamite with his sinker. And, and then you have guys like Mason Engler and, and Tyler Holton, like shout out to Tyler Holton, not getting enough love and Will Vest coming up from AAA and just getting the job done. Jason Shreve, I know he's been up and down at times, but you know he, he's looked pretty good too. And it's a bullpen that you, you wonder how in the heck is this possible? And then you remember who's managing and, and that guy's a wizard um, when it comes to work in the bullpen, but you got to give credit to the guys who are throwing the ball too. And I, I think there, there needs to be something said about that. It's, it's been a really impressive stretch. Flat out amazing stuff between Nieves and Fetter and the strategy of AJ Hinch used deploying his pitching. I mean, how Wentz left the game <laughs> when it was three to two today is, in the third inning, Mark. It was, I mean, in, he had to get him out of there, you know, for his own safety practically. And listen, I think, you know, let it be known that Evan Petzold and Mark Gorosh are actually as terrible as he has pitched 50% of the time. We are both huge Joey Wentz fans today. The stuff is so good. I know, but today, know. And, and, today and, and, what, and what's so weird about that, Ab, is first, first two innings, you know, first inning is always a little shaky. Second inning is always outstanding from Joey Wentz. And the third inning normally has been the inning of, you know, telling the story of the of the outing for Joey and his fastball command. His fastball today. command was bad. Yeah, Woo! we both said it at the same time. Man, it was rough, and I just felt so bad for him because it wasn't like he didn't understand, and they tried to coax him through it and just couldn't get him through it and somehow got him out of there with the game, not out of hand. He, but that's I, the savvy of AJ Hinch, though. Too, he knows there was he knows there's an off day on Monday. He knows there's an off day on Thursday, and he also knows that last Thursday the Tigers had an off day too. You can burn through the bullpen if you need to in a situation like that. I mean, look if they if they were playing a stretch of games where you know they didn't have an off day coming up for another seven days, Joey Wentz is going to have to battle through that. But in this situation, you know that you have rest days why not? Why not throw the bullpen out? That's why he went right to Cisnero in that moment because it was the highest leverage situation. Let's get out of the inning and let's move on from it. That's, that's, that's smart from A.J. Hinch. And by the way, who else was going to Jose Cisnero in the third inning? Right. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> okay. And not only did he get the out, he actually had one of his better outings of the month. So genius, I'm telling it's, you, it's it's stuff that you really have to watch every day to appreciate. And, you know, A.J. Hinch, uh, he's definitely he is the Bobby Fisher of managers and <laughs> he's really, truly outstanding. All right. So as we started last week, big kickoff segments, always going to be something called the big two. The big two is when Mark Gorash asked Evan Putzold. Two big questions. He gets to riff a little bit about things that may be going on, whether they're in the room, out of the room, affecting the team, but topics we think uh, we should be addressing. So let's get to the big two. First, why are pitchers getting better when they pitch for the Tigers? For the most part, not so much the couple starting pitchers this week, but I think Alex Fado would be actually a weird, perfect example of this. He's facing way more difficult hitters in the major leagues, and he's throwing much better in the major leagues than he did in the minor leagues. But in general, why do pitchers get better on the Tigers? And it does not seem like hitters are getting better. Can you talk about that? I think that's a really interesting question. I, I kind of am almost fascinated to know kind of where that question stems from. I think the way that I view it is I think that Pitching, you have a lot of control over the game, right? You, you you have pitches that you get to throw that you can tinker with. You can, you know, sync yourself up and you can look at, you know, wh what's the spin rate on this certain pitch? What's the spin efficiency on this certain pitch? How should I be gripping, you know, my cutter? How should I be gripping my changeup? 
you know, how often should I be throwing a fastball? To what hitter should I be throwing the fastball? Um, and a great situation is Nick Maton, right? Like pitches are going to throw him, you know, off-speed pitches and breaking balls over and over and over again because he only hits fastballs. They're in control in that situation. And as the hitter, I view that as more of the reactionary, you know, kind of element of the sport. You're reacting to all of those external factors. And so I think it might be a little bit more across the board. From a developmental standpoint, I think it's a really good question. And, you know, you got to give a shout out to the guys on the pitching side, Gabe Rebus in the minor leagues. I've only heard great things about him. Um, and obviously he's so aligned with Chris Fetter and everything they're doing at the big league level. And so I do think that that was kind of the first thing that the Tigers synced up, just in the sense of getting a true pitching department. Um, so that might be able to answer the question of the development a little bit more. But we can't forget that just generally speaking, pitchers are in control all the time. And when you're a hitter, you got to react to everything. And so I think just kind of generally speaking, it's easier for pitchers to develop. Maybe not easier, but it's just like it, 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 pitchers can develop maybe at a quicker rate than hitters can because with a hitter, it takes time to be able to you know, prepare for those reactions and, and understand what you're going to get you know, thrown every single time. And you're facing different guys you know, nonstop with different stuff that moves maybe just a little bit different than the other guy. And I think that can be difficult. But I do think from a developmental side, the Tigers did a really good job of aligning their pitching department almost immediately. You know, that's Ryan Garko, Chris Fetter, and, and Gabe Rebus, obviously. And I think we're only now recently just starting to see the hitting department becoming aligned. And I don't think that's only at the big league level. I also think that's, you know, in the minor leagues too. Like I, I've always kind of viewed it that way. And when Garko came in and, and made his hires was, you know, let's get the pitching right first. Like that's going to be the number one priority. And it's not that they put the hitting, you know, off to the wayside and just say, yeah, we don't care about this. Like, of course they care about it. Um, but now I think there's just more of an emphasis on how can we get the hitters up to speed and how can we, how can we develop those hitters? I don't, I don't know if that entirely answers the question, but I do think it's a little bit of, a little bit of both there. It's certainly frustrating when you have guys like Spencer Torkelson and, and Riley Green, you know, not getting it done at certain times, but, I think they've been pretty good in May. And um, I think there's something to be said for that too, because even in the big leagues, they're developing. It is, it is a constant development uh, for these guys. I mean, they're, they're 22, 23, 24 years old. You know, it's, it's not an easy game either. And it's the reactionary part of the sport. So I, I think it's a little bit of both. Well, while we're at it, let's discuss how some people are performing in May. And we have discussed many of these guys at infinitum and it seems like sometimes their season isn't going that well but i would probably like to bring some data you know to the forefront that says maybe they're doing some of them are doing better than we think they're doing so i want to walk through a few things about hitting since i brought up this first question so for the month of may Javi Baez uh, before today at 302, 375, 535 has earned 0.6 war for the month of May, and he's at a 155 WRC plus. And most amazing data, he has three homers, five RBIs. The most amazing piece of data about Javi Baez, and I don't think there's a person who's ever watched Javi, whether it was longtime Cubs fans or the Met fans who watched him for a half year and the Tiger Give me the fans strikeout who, rate. Give me the ready? strikeout rate. You feed it to me, baby. He, he's walked in the month of May 4.2% of the time, which is not unusually inconsistent with how he normally, you know, takes an approach at the plate. But here's 5.4% for the season, though, so tip the yep. cap there. K rate in Oof. the month of May, 10.4%. Beautiful. Which is, is which people would think was a typo if they didn't know better. So uh Javi at a 155 WRC plus. However, leading the way in the month of May for the Tigers and a person that's been in the middle of everything all the time is Andy Abanez at a 167 WRC plus. He's at 364, 382, 576 for the month. Pretty sweet job by Andy. Now, a player that normally does walk a pretty decent amount of the time, only walking 2.9% of the time. However, only striking out 2.9% of the time in the month of May. And uh, he has 34 plate appearances. That was before today. And 
I think he was one for three in a walk today with a with a big double and a walk at the end of, at the end of the game. If I remember this correctly, Riley Green obviously leading the way, hitting three fifty seven for the month, three fifty seven four hundred five forty eight, a one sixty five WRC plus, just banging away at it, still striking out a little bit, but his ISO is up to one ninety, looking pretty darn good. He's got all five of his doubles this season in May. I mean, he he's yeah. really started to get it going in terms of the extra base hit. And I think there's a lot more in that tank. There's oh, still yeah. more. Eric Haas is uh, at a 141 WRC plus, 314, 351, 514 for the month, two homers, uh, seven ribs, been spanking the ball pretty strong. We got uh, Zach McKinstry at 259, 400, 259. So without an extra base hit, he's at a 102 WRC plus for the month, but actually doing a pretty great job. And in 35 plate appearances, has a 20% walk rate. So got to like that at the top of the order. Hey, Mark, eight walks, four strikeouts in May for your boy, Jordan McKinstry. Jordan is, it. he's making pitchers work. He's getting on on base, especially to lead off innings or games. Spencer Torkelson at 302, 333, 465, a 122 WRC plus. And you and I were talking and I brought this up to you. He's at a 76 WRC plus for the year, which would place him in the bottom six for first baseman in Major League Baseball. But I He's think been better than that. It's I quite think. it's quite misleading because as I said, he's at a one twenty two WRC plus for the month, has six RBIs and been hitting the ball very, very well. He does have some occasional games where he looks a little uh lost in approach at the plate, but for the most part really swinging the bat pretty well. I just believe um, in it, Mark. I just believe in it. Like I understand you look at the raw numbers. You even look at the raw season numbers. I mean, it's it's two thirty one on the season right now, and you know you look at that and you scratch your head, and and that's still not what you want to see. And I understand that, but I mean, I, I still believe in expected numbers. I still believe in the data. I mean, when the expected batting average is two seventy five, and you know the the average exit velocity is in the seventy ninth percentile, and the hard hit rate is in the eighty first percentile, and you know you, I can kind of go on and on with all this stuff. You know, the, the whiff rate is not there like it was last year. He's, he's not swinging and missing at as many pitches. You know, some chase here and there, sure. But I, for the most part, I think he's got a pretty good approach and he's been hitting the ball hard. And I, I know it sucks because it's kind of been what we've talked about since spring training. But this guy's going to get it going at some point. Like, I, I, I believe in the data behind the performance. I also believe in the approach. And I think his mind space is so much different than it was last year. Just talking to him, he exudes confidence. And that's that's almost the number one thing. You gotta be confident in this game. And he's very confident. I think and I, next, I appreciate that. The next fifty, sixty at bats are gonna tell us a lot about Spencer Torkelson because rough start, you know, twenty five percent of the way through the season now. Rough start, first half of the twenty five, solid the last half of the twenty five. Where are we going from here? Yeah. Just doing what he's doing now would be fine. Would like to see a little more power, a few more walks. Drew is second walk of the month of May today. You know, there's more more things to see from him. A lot of people think his defense is very good. You and I had to talk about that today. We actually had a DM argument about it. And once I got done showing you a few things, it's pretty obvious besides being – one of the best scoopers in Major League Baseball, pretty much every other thing he needs to do as a defender, he's been super poor at. Don't so, forget the Tigers played Harold Castro at first base last year. That doesn't make me feel any better. Okay, so I have not thought of Harold Castro even one time before you just mentioned him. And, you know, if you would also like to mention Vic Reyes, uh, shout out to Vic. Shout out to uh, Kieran Steckley, who somehow just had skin probably jump up on the back of his arms, just wondering why and doesn't know. But I'll try to let him know tomorrow. I said the words Victor Reyes. Don't forget and then, Willie. And then uh, there's Willie Castro, who I think has contributed a little bit for uh, the Minnesota Twins. But personally, 
Uh, I think uh, sending Willie Castro to the Minnesota Twins is a secretive way to yeah, sab- hitting, hitting 196. Sab- sabotage them. So uh, we will get to see Heimer Candelario mm-hmm. uh, this weekend. Heimer has, I think, four homers. Is he at homer recently or he's still stuck on four? No, I think he still might be stuck on four. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I think he's hitting like 211, 212, something like that. Yeah, so, um, no, but, so but, but again, I want to... but. Just again, I know I kind of talked about him. You know, Tigers maybe bringing him back, this and that. You know, go to go to Baseball Savant. Look at his percentile rankings. You're going to see a whole lot of blue, and blue is not good. Yeah. Well, I uh, I was once a pretty big Heimer fan. Uh, after last year, I understood it was time for us to part ways. Uh, reminds me of many of my college girlfriends. Enjoyed the time together, but it was time to part ways. So uh, a, little, a little less about the 70s and a little bit more about what have you learned in, in question number two of the big two? We're at the 25% mark. What have we learned? Where are we going? And what do you think the next 25% is going to bring us? Yeah, I think the first thing that we've learned about this team is that they're going to fight. Like this is a resilient baseball team and they're going to compete their butts off. I think you got to tip the cap to that first and foremost because – um, there were times this year where it'd be easy to have non-competitive at bats in situations where, you know, you're, you're down, they got their, their big clothes around the mound and it's just like, all right, yeah, that's game. But the Tigers are going to battle a little bit. They're going to play. Now, one of the things that was concerning early in the season, and it's still kind of been a little bit of an issue, I'll say, is getting the big hit with runners in scoring position. I mean, that's something that they've just continued to struggle with. And there was a stretch where it seemed like they were really starting to lock in on those at bats. And I don't know if it was a, an approach change, if it was just, I don't know if it's luck, if it does it just come down to that, um, or, or it's an approach change. But there was a good stretch there when they were winning games, when they were driving in runners, when they were in scoring position. Not as much in the Seattle series. You know, leaving too many runners on base, just stranding guys left and right. Or which not is hitting frustrating at all. To see. But, <laughs> or, or not hitting at all. But Mark, I think it is important, though, that you know when there are games that you have where you are, you know, two for 12 with runners in scoring position. You are three for 14. Like the good thing is, is that you're getting runners into scoring position. And I think that's the, the, the number one positive to take away from a team that we don't expect to be in the playoffs. I don't think fans expect to be in the playoffs. I think we're seeing better at bats, better approaches, not as many walks. Sure. But a selective aggressive type approach at the plate, which I can buy into. And I, I can buy into that because I think you're going up there with a plan. You're hunting certain pitches and I do believe in in the sense of passing the baton and giving it to the next guy and having team at bats. We've seen that this year. We did not see that at all last year. I mean, I mean, it was like from May on, almost all those guys pretty much checked out and were basically hitting for themselves at that point. They were hitting for their paychecks, you know, trying to get paid on their next stop. And now I think we're seeing more of a team approach. We're seeing really good game plans being executed for the most part. But again, you've got to get it done when it matters most. But overall, I like the fight. I like the resiliency from this team. Um, I think they're a good group of guys that are going to grind day in and day out. And then in terms of some concerns or, or, or kind of other things that we've learned is I, I look at it, I look at the isolated power. And that's been an issue for me so far. The Tigers are last in baseball with a 115 ISO, which means they are not hitting the ball for power. They are not slugging. And that's concerning because you need, you need some slug. Like that, it, some slug would go a really long way for this team. And some power would go a long way for this team. I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green, Javier Baez. Javier Baez, you know, he's got three home runs. He hit him in like a four-day stretch or something like that. I think it might have been three homers in three days, but there were four games because of a doubleheader. You're going to need more power out of him. Eric Haas has two home runs. You've got, you know, one of your guys who's going to hit home runs for you, Kerry Carpenter on the injured list with a shoulder sprain. He had a setback there, so... You know, who knows when he's going to be back. That that seems like it's you know totally up in the air at this point. Jonathan Scope, zero home runs. He's a guy we've talked about, has a track record of hitting home runs. He has not been able to hit home runs for the past two years. Akil Badu has zero home runs and, and pretty much zero power. So the fact that these guys aren't slugging, I think, is, is probably the biggest problem right now and something that you're going to have to watch for in the next 25 games. I think if you start hitting for some power, you're going to see a lot of W's go up on the board because you're getting runners on base, because you're creating opportunities for yourselves. But if that doesn't come around, it might just be more of the same. 
Yeah, they got some lineup holes. I mean, right field and left field are like giant, giant deserts of offensive production. I mean, Akil Badu, zero barrels in the 2023 season. I think I published his numbers since the beginning of 2022. Uh, he's a 64 WRC plus. So Not good. you people don't like it when we're mean to Akil Badu, cry me a river. I mean, come on. You got a full season plus a month. Uh, he's got five barrels and 300 plate appearances. It's not like he doesn't have power. He had plenty of power in the 2021 season. He just can't execute a power swing on the baseball right now. Hey, but he walks. He, he does walk. I'll give him that. And he's played adequate defense, and he does create some havoc on the bases. But really, to be blunt about it, if Kerry Carpenter was healthy, he'd be playing in Toledo. So, you know, let's... As far as right field goes, look, Matt Vierling's had a few good games, done a few good things this year. For the month, he's 4 for 43, and you just can't have Matt Vierling, Nick Maton, and Miguel Cabrera, and I'll tolerate Miguel Cabrera playing poorly. He's, you know, given us... uh, 15 years of unbelievable production, you know, maybe 13 of the 15, but, you know, it's very difficult to navigate an offensive lineup with three guys who produce zero. They actually produce negative WRC plus, which is extremely difficult to do. Hinch has tried to navigate that a little bit. It's why Ibanez plays third base almost every day now. Maton has been out of the lineup quite a bit recently. And no matter how much AJ talks about protecting him and knowing how important he is in the locker room, and he is extremely important in the locker room. But if Nick Maton does not start hitting the baseball starting immediately, he's going to go down to Toledo and have to start working his way back. And Jay Hen, Justin Henry Malloy will come up here and, start getting his at-bats, whether it's at DH or third base, but it's not really ideal because it makes them too right-handed. But you just cannot play guys that are hitting, you know, 155 and have gotten five hits in their last 55 plate appearances. It's a really tough spot for Nick Maton just because of the fact that, you know, all he can do is hit fastballs, and that's kind of been – his his career trajectory so far. I mean, I, I remember even writing about it when the trade happened, and, and you know, you and I had conversations about it when the trade happened. Um, the, the biggest question was, how is he going to hit breakers, and how is he going to hit off speed? And so far, he's zero for thirteen against off speed pitches, and he is four for thirty six against breaking balls. And sure, he can hit fastballs, but what happens when they stop throwing you fastballs? And he is not seeing any fastballs. Uh, I mean, Shane Bieber absolutely carved him up in that Cleveland series and didn't throw any fastballs. Um, He's carved up by the Mariners back-to-back days, didn't see any fastballs. So if teams aren't going to throw you fastballs and you can't hit anything else and you can't lay off those pitches down in the zone either, like it's just not a conducive, it's it's not a good environment for you to be developing, right? Like I would think that that would make the most sense to me. It's like, why continue to roll him out there over and over and over again if this isn't the best environment for him to really be able to focus on those things and try to work on either a probably first and foremost is the approach and and laying off those pitches, right? Because if you're going to lay off those pitches, you're going to draw your walks and you're also going to force them to pitch you fastballs because you know, you're going to be in a good count and then you're going to get your fastball because the pitcher is going to have to get back ahead or B or B, which is, you know, potentially swing mechanics, changing some things to be able to get to those pitches. I think probably approach comes first, then maybe some things with the swing. But point is, the big leagues probably isn't the best place to do that because these are elite pitchers who are going to throw you spin over and over and over again because you just can't hit it. Now, I think Nick Maton has a ton of potential. I think Nick Maton can be a really good player because we see what he can do against fastballs. We saw what he did against uh, against some really good pitchers. I mean, he's come up in some really big spots for the Tigers at times this season. Again, all four of his home runs against fastballs. So I just don't think that this is the best environment for him either. He's got to turn it around real quick. 
but he, he's not going to see anything other than the, the breaking balls and the off speed. So I just, I, I don't really see how it gets any better without a demotion down to Toledo. Now we'll see what happens. Maybe he proves me wrong. But yeah, that's something to watch over the next, I, honestly, I would say w- within this week. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. All right, I want to talk about Spencer Turnbull. But first, we're going to take a break. Little, uh, little drama this week. Spencer Turnbull, after St. Louis, was demoted to Toledo to work out his inconsistency and what's transpired since. Why don't you regale regale us with what's transpired? Because never reported, got a new agent. Tell us about some of the things that are going on, and then we can both offer a little opinion about what's up. For sure. Just the Cliff Notes version for people that maybe missed out. Um, Turnbull goes into a hotel room on May 6th. It's Scott Harris sitting there, A.J. Hinch sitting there, and Chris Fetter sitting there. And they basically tell him that he was you know, going to be sent down to Toledo. They talked to him about things that he was doing well. They also talked about some of the adjustments that they wanted him to make on the mound and talked about how the big leagues, kind of like I was talking about with Nick Maton, right? They, they mentioned to him the big leagues probably aren't the best environment for those adjustments, and they felt like he needed some time to be in the minor leagues. Turnbull kind of takes the demotion, leaves the room, and then immediately calls A.J. Hinch and Scott Harris. Scott Harris picks up the phone. And then Turnbull talks about, you know, some neck discomfort that he's been having and Tigers end up setting up an appointment with the doctor. There's a specialist that he goes and sees out of state. The doctors kind of get together. They, you know, look at the the medical exams, the MRI, they check out everything and they all kind of confirm the injury. And then Turnbull goes on the injured list. And now kind of behind all that is some service time stuff that, you know, obviously mattered to Turnbull. I, I don't know if it was any part of the Tigers decision making. I mean, look, the guy had a what do you have? I mean, he had a, a seven, was it a seven, two, six ERA in seven starts? I think it was, but it um, still should have mattered to Turnbull. It may not matter to us. It doesn't matter to management as much as Turnbull would like to think. No, I understand. No, I understand. It matters to Turnbull and, and, and rightfully so as it, and, I mean, look, it would matter if I was in his shoes. It mattered you know, to you if you were in his shoes and explain to everybody why it matters so much to be able to be a free agent after next year because you brought up a name to me and how much he got paid. It's a great comp. Explain that. So, you know, yeah, I mean, ba- no, basically the, the way that it goes down is, you know, if he spends about a month in the minor leagues as an option player, it would have delayed his free agency by one year. So he's set to be a free agent after the 2024 season. If he would have been down in the minor leagues for about a month, it's not until after the 2025 season. The Tigers get an extra year of control of Spencer Turnbull. And for me, I said, look, at some point, this rotation is going to have Casey Mize, Tarek Skubal, Matt Manning. You know, Joey Wentz can be in the mix. Alex Baedo can be in the mix. Uh, Wilmer Flores, if he's not pushed to the bullpen, could be in the mix. Ty Madden. Like there's, regardless, oh, they're going to go right. sign some guys, like whatever it is, right? Guys are going to be in the mix. And for Turnbull, I mean, he to me, he kind of seems like a bullpen candidate coming back what? from Tommy John surgery. But remember Michael Fulmer, and that was the name that I brought up to you. And well, let's even go deeper than that about money. How about how much money did they pay Michael Lorenzen? Yeah, no, I will look. I mean, yeah, they paid him eight point five million. They paid okay. Matthew Boyd ten million dollars. All right, so if you go look up Michael Lorenzen's career, he was primarily a reliever. Became a, he was a starter back occasionally with Cincinnati last year. Had a pretty decent year, especially it finished really well in September. Mm -hmm. Got $8.5 million. Is he especially better than Spencer Turnbull from a career arc standpoint? Probably a decent comp right there. Okay. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So do I think Spencer Turnbull has a chance to get paid $8.5 million? He might. Maybe. He might. He, Maybe. He, it, it, if Spencer Turnbull had a good six or seven weeks to end the 2024 season, I'll wager you he would get $8.5 million. Now, it seems incredibly far-fetched after watching five years of Spencer Turnbull throw that that would happen. But I am telling you, it happens all the damn time. I know what so, you're saying. I mean, I, I but I kind of viewed it in the sense of, 
hey, for me, like the way that he's pitched across his entire career, we know the stuff that he can have in 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 brief periods of time, right? He flashes it so well. To me, he he screams bullpen, and that made me think about Michael Fulmer. And I said, man, like, you know, could you imagine if the Tigers had another year of Michael Fulmer? Let's just say, right? Like that that that's a pretty big bonus as a team. So I'm not saying that that had any didn't play into to the Tigers decision. I don't think it did, but I do understand why, you know, that caught the attention of Spencer Turnbull. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously ends up on the injured list. So now that he's on the injured list, he, the option has been rescinded. He also switched agents. He's now represented by Scott Boris. Um, that's kind of, you know, side notes in, in all of this as well. So yeah, Spencer Turnbull is going to be with the Tigers on Tuesday, rehabbing at Comerica park and he'll be with the team and, We'll see how it goes. We'll see when he's able to to get back on the mound and start throwing again and and see where it goes from there. But again, the Tigers want him to make adjustments. Is he going to have to do that? Even when he comes back from the injured list, they could always just send him down anyway again. So yeah, well, here's we'll the see Gorash, what happens. Here's the Gorash take on Spencer Turnbull. We're in year five. He's a 12 and 29 pitcher in his career. It's been on the DL four times at least that I can count. There may be five or six in there for short stints that I've missed. I think he's teased us with two good outings, then five terrible outings so many times over five years that I've lost count. He's always got something a little wrong. He doesn't feel good. His shoulder's a little tight. His elbow's bothering him. His groin is hurting. Something's always taken away from his performance metric. Then we had this last episode, and he now has Scott Boris as his agent. And if you know anything about Scott Boris, and I'm a big Scott Boris fan between between me and you, especially if I was a player, but I can promise you the idea of making Spencer Turnbull a, re- a reliever ended the moment that S- Scott Boris became his agent, A. And B, I've said privately to you and to other people in the baseball business, in the baseball writing business, that I would say he's probably pissed off A.J. Hinch and Scott Harris enough that if I had to place a bet, I don't think he throws another inning for the Detroit Tigers. So Hmm. I think there'll be interest from other teams. I threw out something crazy today, which was, you know, Tyler O'Neill has got sort of the same circumstances in St. Louis that Spencer Turnbull has in Detroit. He's going to be a free agent. At the end of the 2024 season, he's done nothing but frustrate the Cardinals front office. And guess who his agent is? Scott Boris. That's right. So Scott Boris has a funny way of getting things done, of getting things done. And to be honest with you, the Tigers have a right fielder that's four for his last 43. And Detroit could use some power and an outfielder that can produce. And as frustrating as Tyler O'Neill has been to the Cardinals, he'd be a pretty vast improvement in Detroit. And the Cardinals need pitching in the worst way and have often done really good jobs, you know, improving pitchers once they get to St. Louis. So, you know, I see a, a match there. I don't necessarily think it's a fair trade purely on paper, But I think when you take the entire sphere of what's going on and having the same agent, it's worth a discussion. I don't think Spencer Turnbull's endeared himself to the locker room. I think they understand the service time issue, but eventually, you know, you have a culture for your team. And, you know, I maybe I'm talking about stuff I have absolutely no real idea of, but somehow I don't feel like the way this team grinds and Spencer Turnbull are cut from the same, you know, they're not coming from the same place. So that that's just my two cents. Yes, I have a big mouth sometimes. Yes, I have vendettas in a weird way against certain players that I don't think can play at all. But, you know, I think, you know, Spencer Turnbull definitely has some skill and it might be a change of scenery, might be a good idea for him. Other teams will think they can 
maybe get more out of them than the Tigers have. And I'd like to see us try to get a play, you know, the Tigers try to get a player back that maybe has some similar circumstances that maybe can be productive for the Tigers that could use a change of scenery, has similar service time. No, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea. I mean, I think, you know, I think he's got to get healthy first. I think that's probably first and foremost is at least just to show that he can pitch, whether it's on rehab assignment or, or, or whatever it is. But yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, only time will tell in this situation. Um, I think he can be a, a, a very useful pitcher, whether it's for the Tigers or for for someone else. So yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Definitely interesting, though. Definitely yep. interesting week in that sense. Hey, and it, and it brought Scott Harris out to talk about it, too, which I yeah, thought was w- kind of interesting. Now, he didn't say a whole lot. He talked for a while, but didn't have a, a, a whole lot to say. But the way that he recounted the whole Turnbull situation, that lined up with everything else that I was hearing from other people too. So um, I do want to make note of that, that that everything that he said was pretty dang spot on. Actually, 100% spot on. It was nice to see Scott go talk to somebody. Of course, he talked to national media darling Steve Phillips. I think Steve's on at 3 o'clock in the morning now. What's when Steve on the MLB network? Uh, I, I... (laughs) <laughs> they, they've kind of buried Steve. I think he's on at like seven in the morning or so. who knows. I can't even remember anymore, but I am a little disappointed that Scott can't seem to surface to talk to his own beat writers for uh, 20 minutes since the season started. That's, it's a little disconcerting to me. Well, he and came more, out. So give him some credit for finally coming out. Okay. But. Well, that that's good. Talking to Steve Phillips on MLB Network. I don't <laughs> Talk know. Talk to Steve weekend. first, but yeah. yeah but that, that's good. That's, I'm real proud of him. So I'd, lo- I'd like to see him be a little more visible to his own fan base and maybe answer a few questions to people who have paid attention to the games, uh, you know, instead of Steve Phillips. All right. I wanted to ask you, Matthew Boyd, you know, really rough outing last time out. You know, there's some frustration. Is he going to be a dude? Is he going to not be a dude? What are we getting? And I want to hear your take on it. You might be surprised at my take on it. Yeah, I think for Matt, like he's a guy that we know he can pitch. We know his stuff is good. It's kind of all that anyone's ever talked about, though. It's just that he has really good stuff and he has, you know, some pretty good stretches where he can string things together. And then he also has some times where he just completely loses it. And what happened against Seattle was, was to me, pretty unacceptable. I think he would agree with that where he just didn't have it at all. He didn't have it at all. He went one and a third, um, six runs, five earned runs, four walks in one strikeout through 55 pitches, and just, again, completely didn't have it. Um, and then there are, there are other outings where he totally has it, and then he'll give up a home run or give up a two-run shot, and you know it kind of muddies the final line, if you will. But I'm just looking to see this guy either break out and, and be a real dude or or is he not? Like what what is Matthew Boyd gonna be for this team? Especially coming back from injury, being back in a starting rotation for the first time since 2021. Like it's not like he has this, you know, immediate recent track record of being a really good starting pitcher. I don't even really know if he has a great record, you know, track record overall of being a great starting pitcher. I think he has, you know, some really good stretches and then some really rough stretches. I just want to see him dial it in a little bit more. I think he's great for the team. I think he's great for the clubhouse. Always has been, always will be one of the best guys that you're ever going to meet. Somebody who, you know, when his changeup is on, his changeup is nasty. When a slider is on, his slider is nasty. Velo really matters for him. If he can get that fastball velo up, he finds himself to uh, to be pretty darn successful. And I think all the secondaries play really well off this fastball when the velo is up a little bit. But I would just like to see a really good Matt Boyd start. I mean, a, a, a six six scoreless, um, get pitching into the seventh inning. Like he's more than capable of doing that um, because we've seen it before. But it's just it, it, it's kind of still waiting for it in 2023. And and I think for me, the the ERA and the numbers reflect what we've seen. I mean, it's a six four seven ERA with 15 walks and in 29 strikeouts and 32 innings, giving up five home runs. Like that's concerning. The fifteen walks, the like that that's that's not what he needs to be doing, and that's not helping the Tigers win. So it's for me, it's more of the question mark of, okay, we've seen what Matthew Boyd has been through the the first seven starts. What can he be in his next seven starts? Can he really lock it in and get it going? And I think that's going to be really important, especially when you have a guy like Eduardo Rodriguez pitching like a complete ace at the top of your rotation. I want to give another shout out to Eduardo in his last six starts. 
It's now a 0-4-3 ERA with six walks in 41 strikeouts in 41 and two-thirds innings. That's elite. That is ace caliber stuff. Um, yeah, if Matt Boyd could do you know even even half of what Eduardo Rodriguez is doing right now, you know his his baseball card numbers would look a lot better. All right, that's uh, young caliber stuff, but I want to come back to that in a second. It's part of a different discussion, and he is the maestro right now, to say the least. But let's let me give you my quick take on Boyd. I think Matthew Boyd is exactly what he is. It's <laughs> Matthew Boyd in seven starts is going to throw keep you in the game. F- you know, four times, one time we don't know what's going to happen, and two times he's going to get his butt handed to him. It's just the nature of the type of pitcher he is right now. And I think to expect a lot more, and I know Matthew Boyd expects a lot more, but at this point in time, there's a pretty long track record of it is what it is. Now, what I would like to ask you is, you've watched a lot of Matthew Boyd in your career. You think his stuff is the same as it used to be worse than it used to be or worse than it used to be. (laughs) Yeah. It's a fair point. Remember the slider that just was, I know um, he could hold the ball up and show the hitter. I'm going to throw a slider. I'm just letting you know, try that, that 2019 slider. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, that let him, that led, that led him to 238 strikeouts in 185 innings. But yeah, and still, even in other seasons, it was still a pretty good slider, dude. It was look, you're not going to hit this, and you don't know if it's going to be a strike or hit you in the foot. Where's that been? Okay, you know, look, Matthew Boyd, if he has to live on his fastball, is going to be, you know, on a respirator pretty quick. Toast, yeah, he's toast. But if he has something to go with his fastball. It lets him get away with some mistakes. But if you're expecting Matthew Boyd to be dominant, I I just, yes, he's had a dominant month. He's had a dominant two months. I'd settle for a dominant three weeks at this point. But I just really think Matthew Boyd right now, I'm just happy when he keeps us in the game. All I know is all I know is when the Tigers signed him, Scott Harris talked about signing Matt Boyd because he thought that he could help the team get off to a fast start. And so far, we haven't seen that from Matt Boyd. I find that concerning. I haven't really thought too much about anything Scott Harris has said because to be really blunt about it, I haven't heard Scott Harris talk to anybody, not since spring training. And and when Scott decides he wants to start having a frank discussion about where we're at, we can go over the fact that, you know, Andy Ibanez has contributed a decent amount, 45 at-bats. Jordan McKinstry has been a revelation his last 50, 55 at-bats, and pretty much every other thing he's touched has either been mediocre or frighteningly terrible. So, you know, you want to have a discussion about it, let's have it. I mean, Lorenzen, really good the last two starts, but, you know, that's two starts. I don't get excited about two starts, you know. Bottom line is when Scott wants to come out, have a discussion about what's up, Let's have a discussion about what's up. Until then, you know, I'm not putting a lot of faith in much of anything. So as far as discussing Erod, I think I sent you, I tweeted something and I sent you a little something that was really interesting. And it's about what pitches are the most effective in baseball so far this season. And I was curious because I watch Alex Lang's Curveball, and I go, man, that is a devastating pitch. And, you know, I'm going to go over these numbers. And then what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to we're going to go to our last break. And then when we come back, we're going to finish up with the value of these pitches. All right, we're back. All right, so let's touch on values of pitches. StatCast creates a value system for everybody's pitches, how good they are, how effective they are. And the Tiger with the most effective single pitch this season has been Jason Foley. His sinker is the 11th best pitch, most effective at run prevention in Major League Baseball at a minus eight runs, which is... Pretty amazing, but if you watch him come in from the bullpen and 
throw 98 mile an hour sinkers and people not do too much with it, it shouldn't surprise you. You know, on the Tiger staff, Erod's cutter also is a minus eight runs, and it's the 13th most effective pitch in the major leagues. Believe it or not, Mason Englert's slider is a minus seven runs. It's the 22nd most effective pitch in the major leagues. And then believe this, how about Eduardo Rodriguez? His four-seamer is also a minus seven runs, and it's the 29th most effective pitch in Major League Baseball. So it's no coincidence that Eduardo Rodriguez is this good. He has the 13th and the 29th best pitch in Major League Baseball. He, so I, I, I think he's the only pitcher that has two pitches in the top 30. And you know and, what I love, Mark, about that is he's throwing his four-seamer more than last year. Now, not by much, but he's throwing it more. And he's also throwing his cutter more than he was last year. And that matters to me. Like, if it's working, he is just going with it. And he's, he's not a, trying to do too much. He has such a simplified approach, and he just tears you up. He is like a middleweight on perpetual attack when he comes out of <laughs> He's just shot off the stool, coming straight at you, throwing punches like a madman at all times and executing them. He is literally a revelation. We, w- we watch the game sometimes, and we'll... We'll DM each other, and it's it's like the seventh inning, and they're ninety minutes into a game, or you know, it's the eighth inning, and they're ninety minutes into the game. It's the most unbelievable thing I've seen in many a years. It's you know, he he continually pounds the strike zone with no fear, with more than one pitch, and the pitch execution is is like watching a, a, a beautiful musician play, you know. A, a, a concert. It's it's pretty amazing. Finally, Alex Lang's curveball is a minus six runs. It's nothing to <laughs> denigrate. I mean, it's it's a pretty incredible rating. It's it's an unbelievable swing and miss pitch. But it's it's the fortieth best pitch in dominance and run prevention in baseball. And that's nothing to sneeze at. Remember, pitchers throw three or four pitches, and there's probably, you know, 350 pitchers in baseball. So, I mean, they're, you know, to be ranked 40 of a possible 1,000 iterations of this and you're ranked in the top 5% is a pretty amazing, you know, quality of pitch. To well, give that, pitch you is, that pitch is nasty. I mean, it's 47% whiff rate, 18 of his strikeouts with the curveball, and he is just pouring it in there, too. I mean, that's a pitch that he's throwing more this year than he was last year. He's throwing it like 57, 58% of the time. And it's just, that's one of those pitches where it's, hey, you know I'm about to throw this pitch. You're not going to hit it. Let's ride. And as long as he's able to locate at times and, and keep himself in counts, it's all good. Today was a perfect example of that. I mean, gets an out, walks two guys. Mm-hmm. I start rage tweeting just because... You know, you just, come on, you can't walk two guys ahead five to three in the ninth, okay? And uh, then I think he pretty Took much... Took out back-to-back threw, batters. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think he threw nothing but curveballs for the next two hitters. And they, you know, could do nothing with it. And the game, all of a sudden, the game was over. And, you know, it's a perfect example. I don't. It's a microcosm of the effectiveness of Alex Lang and his curveball. It's just unhittable. So, I mean, it would almost be unfair if he had any fastball command whatsoever. It would, it would, you know, he's got a good chance to make the all-star team if he continues at this pace anyway, but. Fastball command would be, would, would, would be like, that'd be pretty insane to add that kind of to what he can do. I mean, if he's able to have that curveball and also command his fastball whenever he wants, I, I mean, I'm almost speechless thinking about what that would look like because he's already been really, really good for the Tigers this year. I mean, it's a it's a one one three ERA or something like that, and, and only seven walks and twenty one strikeouts. I mean, the walks are something that I've always been you know concerned about with him, but he hasn't let the Tigers down. I mean, he's got seven saves this year. Don't call him a closer, but he's getting the job done in the ninth. Yeah, he's getting the job done to say the least, and. He, the, the scary thing is, like I said, if you know, he, there there is some room for improvement. 
I mean, pitch efficiency and some fastball command, and it, it's already pretty unfair. It would be totally unfair at, uh, <laughs> if, if, if that ticked up at all. Yeah, so. it would. All right. We want, we also wanted to kind of give a shout out that, you know, Michael Lorenzen's really, really been good the last two outings. There's a little story behind it because I think what you shared with me is they, they've tweaked a few things about his pitch mix, right? Yeah. I do think this is where you got to tip the cap to some of the things that the Tigers are doing. You know, it's Robin Lund, right? Bringing a guy like that into the organization, somebody who's, you know, ultra locked in to biomechanics and the way that, that your body moves and, you know, what you need to be doing. And it's a combination of him and Chris Fetter and, you know, also Scott Harris for bringing in Michael Lorenzen, but yeah, he used to throw seven pitches. Now he's throwing five. They've simplified everything about the way in which he's going about attacking. And so far they're seeing some of the results of that recently, obviously got off to a little bit of a slow start, but it all kind of goes back to when he moved his arm slot back up. In, in September of 2022 with the Angels coming back from an injury that helped separate his four-seamer from his changeup, created a little bit more of a consistent slider movement. He was able to get the, the, the hard slider that he has back as opposed to the sweeping slider. And he's been going to that a lot. So, yeah, it's been pretty good. He's relying on, you know, really four pitches, which is the four-seamer, the changeup, the slider, and the sinker. He also throws the sweeper, the cutter, and the curveball, but he's not using those three as often. Last season, he threw more sinkers than four-seamers and more sweepers than sliders. Now he's throwing more four-seamers than sinkers, and he's throwing more sliders than sweepers. And so far, so good. He, he lost the bullet slider. He's got it back now. Uh, the four-seamer seems to be working well for him. Again, for him, it always comes down to you know how consistently can he command his pitches? Is he able to keep him in the strike zone and locate him? And when he's able to do that, he's, he's pretty much dynamite. But I think taking some away was probably better than trying to add more to his mix, right? Like you're, 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 you're simplifying it down to, okay, we want you to do this, this, and this, and just do that. And you're going to be great. Those are your strengths. Just do it. And he's totally bought into what the Tigers have had planned out for him. He watched a ton of videos of him throwing his changeups in the 2019 and 2022 season, took that into a start against Cleveland and his changeup was excellent. I think that's a pretty positive development moving forward and something, you know, to watch for with his next start, but all good things. I, I think that that's a good, I think that's a positive thing that the Tigers are doing, right? You talk about the pitching and why the pitching develops and, and the hitting maybe doesn't as much. And here's a perfect example of them taking a guy who's been in the big leagues for a really long time, simplifying some things and letting him run with it. Now we'll see if he's able to sustain it. That's, that's the next big question. Hey, look, his last outing was probably the best outing, by any starting pitcher this year, not named Eduardo Rodriguez. True so that. He was really, really good. So I'm excited to see if he can build on that, find some consistency, and God knows they need more consist consistency in their rotation. Oh yes, they do. Um, let's before we get out of here, I wanna I wanted to ask you. I saw a few things about Matt Manning, and I almost wonder why they put him on the 60 day. I mean, I understand the procedural, you know, idea of creating a roster spot, but from everything I'm hearing, you know, maybe they're losing two or three weeks when he could have been throwing and he's going to be sitting on the DL. Can you touch on that for a second? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, that's again, just an interesting, interesting situation. Maybe one to dig into a little bit more, um, to try to give, you know, maybe a little bit more of a detailed answer for our listeners next week, but um, again, it never really seemed like the foot thing was going to be a, a, a 60 day ordeal. And then all of a sudden it became a 60 day, you know, situation. And, you know, now it seems like he's going to be back before then. And I'm not, I mean, look, he'd rather safe than sorry with Matt Manning. I mean, again, he had the situation last year where you know, he didn't come clean about an injury and ended up pitching in Toledo and was trying to make these starts to get back. And then he ends up hitting the shelf for even longer after the start in Toronto, where, you know, he broke the bone in his foot. He talked about, oh, it's just a foot. Like, I can pitch through it. Like, the guy doesn't want to be injured. I get it. Maybe from the Tigers' standpoint, it's just better safe than sorry. Let's just take our time with him, make sure that we can get him back 100%. We know he's healthy. He knows he's healthy. And there's no uh, no shenanigans like that going on where, you know, he's trying to pitch through something again. That's the last thing that you want. You really need him in the rotation. You need to get him to have as, as much of a full season as he can possibly have the rest of the way. So 
probably just a, a better safe than sorry, but I'll do some more digging on that and see what we can come up with. All right. Well, we've covered just a ton of topics this week. It's been fun. This has been the late night version of uh, Days of Roar. So I'd like to remind everybody to please rate, share, and subscribe to Days of Roar wherever you listen to podcasts. I don't care if it's Android, Google, Stitcher, Apple, Amazon. There's a million places, but please, uh, please give us a listen. And I'd also like to thank our produ- executive producer, uh, Kirk Crawford, sports editor of Detroit Free Press, uh, executive producer, uh, Anjanette Delgado, our regular producer, Robert Chan, who always makes us sound so great. As usual, I'd like to thank my grandson, Braden Michael Gorosh, who I got a chance to uh, hang out with this weekend, played Bubbles on the Porch. It was pretty fun. And, you know, to all the moms for Mother's Day, I'd like to wish a happy Mother's Day, including my mother, Lenore Gorosh, 85 years young. Had a good time with her. Uh, And as usual, I'd like to also thank Savannah for letting Evan stay up so late and do the podcast with us. So for Evan Petzl, this is Mark Gorosh. We'll see you same bad time, same bad station next week. And peace. Peace.